start that now. And so we are very happy and honored to be joined today by a couple of um, distinguished guests. Uh, first of all, Frank, thank you for joining. We have a number of topics that we want to cover and we're excited to, to speak about them with you. Um, really appreciate the time that you're taking to share your perspectives as a security engineer. So before we begin, would you be able to just share a little bit about yourself and your role and you know, how unique your role is? Yeah, sure. So I did my PhD in cybersecurity at MIT, and I've been in the security industry for over a decade. And so I did a short stint in venture capital investing in cybersecurity. And that's how I got to know Tom. And now I'm a staff security engineer at um, this company called DBT Labs. And we're working to kind of make sure that um, we bring engineering solutions um, to security. And you also have a blog, right? Yeah, I do have a blog. Um, it's called Frankly Speaking, actually. Um, it's uh, it's at franklyspeaking.substack.com, where I uh, speak very frankly about various trends in cybersecurity. So I'm making the most use out of my name there. So <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so, all right, uh, Tom, do you want to introduce yourself and also take it from here in terms of the questions you have for Frank? Yeah, sure, sure. I think we meant this to be uh, an open conversation. So Karen, feel free uh, to join in as well. So my uh, my name is Tom. I'm the uh, co-creator and CEO of AppDome, who's sponsoring uh, this chat. And uh, uh, had a like Frank a long history in uh, in cyber, uh, more of a self-taught coder and 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 the like. So. Uh, don't have the distinguished credentials as Frank, so thank you very much, Frank, for for coming and and sharing your your in depth knowledge uh, on these topics. Uh, I'll try to keep up and do do a good job do a good job at that. Um, so I think the the point of this is really to to just have a conversation and talk about uh, the topics that face the modern. Uh, Sorry, for those of you who are joining, please put yourselves on mute, and if you have any questions. Um, just enter them in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. So the purpose of this purpose of this uh, this chat is to talk about the the challenges facing the modern security organization. And so we'll we'll why don't we set the stage for us, Frank? I mean, kind of high level. You know, uh, what do you think are kind of the overall goal of a of a security team uh, within an organization today? So let's just kind of level set on on kind of the objective and priorities of a, of a modern day cyber organization? Yeah, I think cyber organizations have, have, have evolved over time and they're now kind of tasked with two major goals in my mind. I think one is to obviously fulfill compliance requirements as a SOC 2, HIPAA, ISO. And I think the second thing, which is relatively new, is that um, they're tasked with developing solutions to help manage um, security risk across the organization. And, and how how new would you say that that development part is? Because that's that's something that I don't I know in my journeys I I don't find many cyber many CISO organizations that have an engineering arm. Like is that recent or is that in particular industries? How do you how do you view that? Yeah, I think it's definitely more recent. I would say probably in the last ten years. I think when I started doing security, um, there was kind of a lot of talk around cloud security and what the cloud public cloud would mean for organization and people have really just started using the cloud and i think the introduction of engineering into security is actually very um correlated or directly correlated in the way that um you know devops came to be like the introduction of engineering into it yeah, and infrastructure fantastic and is the and and would you say that the that the engineering side of the cyber team has the same mission as the as the broader CISO organization, or is it is it unique in in what its objectives are? Yeah, I think the engineering group is unique, and I think like you know we have security organizations at different companies based on different needs, and there's not kind of I would say one type of organization. And I kind of you know think a lot about this. And I've seen a bunch of organizations, both in my time in venture capital and, and kind of now as someone who, who's an operator. Um, 
I would say the engineering team is tasked with, I would describe like coming up with technical solutions um, to magic risks. Like I, I don't want to overuse the word, but it's basically engineering solutions rather than just like operational solutions um, per se. So kind of in the same way um, they view security as a product or a platform um, as any other engineering function would. Um, and you know, we typically and security engineering sits with the engineering or and closely collaborates and it's made up of software engineers. Yeah, I mean, I know for 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 myself and my own journeys and meeting with customers and so forth, there definitely, I would say, sort of three classes of of cyber organizations. So on the one hand, you have what I'd call the uh, the traditional, which is you have a, a a set of cyber professionals who are, uh, uh, very knowledgeable about the compliance objectives and the rules to follow, et cetera, uh, best practices and so forth. Um, and they're strong technically, uh, but they're not, they're not engineers. They're not, they're not builders or coders and that sort of thing, uh, but very, very strong technically. Uh, you have kind of the second class, which I'll call the advanced uh, uh, um, organization where the cyber organization might have researchers or architects on staff, uh, whose job it is to do whatever it is, penetration testing or evaluations of products or who can design kind of kind of uh, systems and so forth. And then you have what 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 you're describing, which is, you know, the cyber plus engineering organization. And those have like like hardcore engineering talent that that can build and deliver you know, solutions uh, into the modern modern organization. So I definitely would say that that, that that to me is kind of the pinnacle of it, you know, of of a great cyber organization. I would definitely say that you know folks are moving there. I for me, um, uh, and I would definitely say it would be a goal. So let me let me. That's actually a great segue into the into the into one of the to a to a deeper topic, and we'll keep kind of going down as we go as we go through this into the rabbit hole here. But so within this context of, of cyber and cyber engineering and, and delivery versus discovery and so forth, um, tell me a bit about, about the role of, 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 of DevSecOps versus SecOps, you know, et cetera. Like, how do you view, uh, how do you view those two uh, disciplines kind of playing uh, together or maybe not together? Like, how do you, how do you view them working um, in a modern organization today? Yeah, I think it's, there's definitely a lot of evolution. I don't think there's a right answer here um, in the sense of like an ideal organizational construct. And I would love to hear from you after I describe a little bit of this, you kind of describe those three types of organizations and how you see how they treat DevSecOps and SecOps. And in my mind, I think the very, um, SecOps is kind of more of the traditional security operations. We have analysts, we have a SOC, we have people looking at dashboards, we have people, you know, doing incident response, but it's kind of a very operations um, heavy, um, people heavy kind of organization. Whereas like DevSecOps is, I would describe like IT security's response or security response to DevOps, which is, hey, you know, it's clear that now we need engineers to manage our infrastructure. We now need um, security engineers to manage security. And so they're kind of deep in the product, in the platform, um, trying to really develop, um, kind of solve operational challenges through kind of a mixture of tooling, uh, better engineering processes. And so kind of like what I describe or what even our company describes is kind of scaling our, our way up, meaning like, hey, making are kind of mundane tasks more automated so that we can kind of focus on the next priority and then we, we don't have to worry so much about these problems. And, you know, instead of throwing, uh, I think every leader thinks about this, it's like, hey, a way to solve a problem is three ways, people, process, and tools. Uh, and instead of throwing people at the problem, we start throwing uh, process and tools. Yeah, so it sounds like if I if I understand the answer correctly, you're, you're saying kind of the SecOps function is sort of on its own. It's out there. It, you know, we have a SOC, we're looking at data, we have analysts who are doing incident response, what have you. Uh, and it's separate and apart from the from the DevSecOps, uh, call it process people improvement system improvement journey that that organizations make. And that 
in that the evolution of an organization or, or its ability to increase velocity and agility really comes on the dev SecOps side, maybe not so much on the on the on the SecOps side. Did I get that? Did I get that right? Or would you? Yeah, that's it? right. And I think like maybe it's not clear because there's a there's some, a little bit of nuance and there's kind of a lot of kind of things in flux. I would describe like around kind of organizational design, and I don't think there's like an ideal way. So, for example, at least. For, for just to use our company as, as an example, we have kind of a compliance function, which is doing SOC audits, um, dealing with security training. I would describe that as a little bit of SecOps, uh, but also on our team, the security engineering team, we have an operations person um, who does SecOps, but um, her job is primarily around the fact that, hey, we're kind of like our own mini engineering organization because we have our own tools we need to manage. We manage like certain programs that typically would span multiple engineering teams that get split ownership. Like an example is like pen tests, um, kind of triaging with other companies around vulnerabilities. And so there's kind of a lot of like operational work that we can't automate away that we still have to deal with. And a lot of, you know, engineering orgs in general have this idea of an engineering um, operations person or uh, a TPM, a technical um, project manager to make sure we deliver on certain um, certain solutions. But I think like security engineering, just, we you know, we have our own tools. We have just a lot more, just I want to describe stuff that like usually gets split across multiple organizations. And a lot of, I think, SecOps's evolution um, is to kind of helping support, uh, uh, partially doing the compliance and partially to like support a lot of the operations inside of security engineering to like make make you know security engineering more productive right yeah yeah you know i just i just came back uh we were talking a bit more bit before the before we started the webinar you know i just came back from uh the philippines uh we have a number of customers out there and you know uh, uh our customer was holding a what they called an innovation festival and so they brought all their cyber teams in from around apac and and they had you know, we all had this lots of CISOs from different banks and so forth around the country. And one of the one of the things, the themes that kept coming up over and over again is transforming the cyber organization from a compliance organization to an operational organization. Like how do you go from a world in which you're you're, you know, in an oversight role to a to a world in which you're in a delivery role? And so I think a lot of what you're talking about from the standpoint of SecOps, like even SecOps is bleeding into this, you know, into this question of like, you know, how do you improve operational efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. And DevSecOps certainly, you know, trying to achieve that. Uh, I think DevSecOps is, is trying to achieve, you know, other things, not just internally, operationally, but but externally from a from a true deliverable consumptive, you know, product that the consumer has. But but all of these functions together are sort of gener you know not generationally is probably the wrong word but but evolutionarily you know uh uh moving much and much closer to an operational line function uh if not already in a line function in your case right because you have an engineering organization oh you're know, moving very quickly into that operational function from pure compliance and so i i totally agree i totally agree with that and and honestly when i talk to CISOs you know that's my big thing i say hey you know you You've got to think about delivery number one. Delivery is your top goal when you're thinking about, you know, when you're thinking about security or defenses inside, you know, of a mobile app or a mobile infrastructure or whatever. You've got to be thinking about how do you get how do you get a consistent outcome, you know, repeatedly over and over and over again. In our case, into the hands of the user. You know, in your case, you know, into the into the infrastructure that's that's being used or tapped into by the user. You know how do you how do you turn that into an operational reality without too many dependencies on other groups and other functions? And so I do think that that's a big, big, big uh, trend out there is moving away from just pure compliance into that. Um, so on on the dev SecOps side, uh, you know, what would you say? I mean, is it is it is it all been rose petals and butterflies? Has it been you know all positive and and everything's great? And gee, without dev SecOps, we wouldn't survive. Or would you say that it's a little like, I don't know, uh, are there some pros and cons to it? You know, are there some pros and cons to to what DevSecOps has, has given you 
uh, in that line function in that operating in that operating role. I have my own view of the world, but but I'd love to hear yours first. So, yeah, I mean, definitely isn't all, all roses and petals. Um, I think a lot of it is because uh, we don't have great examples of organizations that are kind of well run with security engineering and just like the concept of security engineering is new. There's a lack of talent. There's you know, kind of all these industry wide problems we're facing. Um, kind of so a lot of the security tooling is designed with compliance in mind rather than DevSecOps, even though despite they say DevSecOps, like compliance pays um, or is the initial go to market motion. And so I think like in some ways, I don't want to call it an identity crisis. Like in every organization, I think security engineering will look a little bit different and have a slightly different function. Um, like for us, like we sit in the middle of the people's modern data stack. So we sit on top of people's Snowflake um, and Databricks and BigQuery instances. So we have kind of a very important role. And in some ways, companies come to us to help mitigate their risk um, in their data stack. Um, and so we do have a lot of room to grow on the product security side, which you know helps us deliver value. But I think there's a lot of value to be delivered on the platform security side for companies in general. But I think a lot of it really depends on what kind of product your company offers out and how your teams are structured. So a lot of it is, you know, kind of just, I wouldn't say struggle is the right word, but just trying to find out ways to deliver value uh, through ways other than FUD, which is a very common way uh, in the path that people have used to deliver value. I'm kind of, everyone says they're not a big fan of FUD and I'm saying, hey, DevSecOps is like the opposite of FUD. Like we're trying to provide value to like engineering teams. So part of our mission for, for my team is to say, hey, we want to enable engineering organizations to um, build secure products or secure platforms and to kind of design secure products and platforms. So a lot of it is around enablement um, and thinking about what that means. And, you know, I think with DevOps and dev tools, like the idea is like, what does enable really mean? And, you know, we have kind of the same in same same ways we struggle with in the same ways as like engineering teams do for functions that are like new-ish uh yeah. I describe or it's like there's a new product feature or like there's <coughs> a new platform feature right so yeah. well that's always you're right I agree I mean that's always been DevSecOps like mission is to provide you know greater visibility and direction and guidance you know to to building secure products and and so forth but the other the other side of it or the dark the dark side of it is and I think we see a little bit of this in in the SecOps, uh, you know, SOC view of the world as well. Is is I think we get to a point where 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 perhaps we run into some fatigue. Uh, you know, like there's only so many. You know, in our world, for example, there's only so many times you can you can have kind of a code scan or a pen test tell you that you know something's wrong and you know uh or for that matter you know i know you know for folks using modern sims and things of that nature like you know you can just get signal fatigue after a while and and so what do you what do you do with it is there is there kind of a a a a, a limit you know is is the does the curve kind of flatten out in your mind uh when you're kind of talking about like like you know on the one hand yeah we build these build these systems on top of data, which is another interesting point I want to come back to, but, you know, to try to deliver a better product and provide insight to the dev teams and in, in what to protect. But do, do you think that there's a downside to it? Do you think that there's, 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 there's a dark side of DevSecOps too? I mean, for all it's, again, rose petals and butterflies, do you think, do you think there's a downside? I, I do think there's a downside, I think, especially <laughs> around the fact that, you know, when we start doing, getting more into the development cycle, like, uh, a lot of the tools we currently have. And as kind of teams transition from a compliance to uh, a value delivery mechanism, it's a, a very common mode of operation. It's just like, hey, find a problem, create tickets for it, and then send the ticket to the dev team. And I think like that's, I think a lot of times that's where things start breaking down and people start missing the long-term picture is like, hey, like developers are getting all these tickets from, you know, all these tools and uh, they're kind of getting this fatigue and they're saying, hey, like now security is just giving us more work. But in some way, we're we're trying to figure out and transition to a state where, hey, here are like actionable tickets you should take. Like 
you know, it's kind of like policing. It's like, hey, you don't really know what's not there unless you kind of look at it. And so I think there's always that friction and challenge there about how do we, we have a lot of these tickets that or Jira tickets or whatever or kind of like um, mechanism people use to, to create work in their organization and how do we manage those? And what is, there, there's a lot of these operational questions like what is security's role? How do we triage it? It's always a point of friction. Um, and you kind of have, it's, we spend a lot of time navigating even in our organization, right? I mean, but that's just true of any engineering organization. Yeah, I think with the, you know, um, I think one of the one of the big challenges in moving from compliance to 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 value creation or value delivery, as you say, is getting out of the world where you're handing things off. You know, we're here. You're basically saying, hey, I found this list of things. Let me send it over there to the engineering team. Wipe my hands. My job's done. Right. Um, because there there is that feedback loop. You know, if you you know, we all have the same image of a DevSecOps infinite loop you know where it kind of comes back and we validate that things were that that the actual thing was built and we gather feedback from from the customer and the customer you know tells us what to do you know to me there is this kind of gap that sits in the middle where you know if you can take data from a real real production environment to know what's happening and use that data to drive your protection decisions and then and then at the same time, be able to validate that the protections that that match that, I think, is a very powerful place to be when you can when you can say both from a compliance and value delivery standpoint that you're doing exactly what you need to be doing to protect against the attacks that are that are occurring. I think that's a that's a it's a huge, huge step up in 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 how you deliver value from a security standpoint. And I it's think also, and sorry, uh, just interject a little bit. There is a question from the audience, and I think this is a great point to share. You know what you're saying there, and tie that back to um, a brief introduction on the company. So, a question from the audience would be: Is you know, could you give a brief introduction of how Aptom works, and probably in the context that you just described, so that um, the audience understands? You know, maybe a few examples of of how this yeah. works and why this yeah. is important. Yeah. Yeah, so our, our evolution is has followed a lot of the evolution that that Frank is Frank is talking about, and 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 there's a lot more to, to say about that evolution from a market perspective. But but in essence, uh, Aptome started off as a DevSecOps tool uh, to build uh, uh, security into a mobile application inside the CI/CD pipeline. So our our view of the world was in the early days that. Uh, you get a pen test or code scan or or what have you, or you get a set of regulatory requirements from cyber or what have you, and you need to deliver those consistently, rapidly, um, uh, inside your uh, automatically inside your pipeline. Use a tool uh, to to do that. Use a use a platform and technology to deliver that into apps. And this solved all kinds of problems. It solved you know resource constraints and you know the availability of cybersecurity engineers like Frank. I mean. Let's face it. I mean, it is hard to to hire folks like 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 Frank and 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 his caliber and keep them inside of an organization. It also it also gave you a system level audit trail and compliance, you know, control, visibility, management, and so forth. Um, along that journey, uh, we realized that that a lot of times what the what the pen tester or the 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 scans were looking for didn't quite always match up with the with the attacks that were going on out in the out in the wild. So we added a component more recently about um, uh, being able to to uh, see uh, attacks from a production environment and use that data to choose the corresponding protection that you deliver in the CICD. So we brought together the the the, the SecOps component or the data component inside the CICD to really help organizations match um, their protection to the threat that's that's going on out there. Again, in a system fully automated without any code or SDK and so forth. Um, and this is all part of a broader trend that, that I think Frank is talking about and, and we're so pleased to have him here chatting about it. And, and what a lot of folks are seeing is this big shift, you know, where cyber is cyber is shifting from compliance to delivery and looking for tools and systems um, and processes to, to be able to, to make that shift, make that leap from just check the box, 
you know, uh, overseers to, to value creation, value delivery uh, parts of the organization. Uh, not every organization is going to be blessed to have a cyber engineering organization. Uh, like, you know, like Frank has a team at, at his company doing that, but not every organization is going to be blessed to have that. And quite frankly, not every organization is going to be blessed to have that in mobile because that's a completely separate discipline. So the ability to be able to leverage technology to fill that gap, I think, is a is a big thing that 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 organizations have to do independent of AppDome as well. I just think that, you know, technology has to fill those gaps and, and we have an amazing product uh, that does that. So you know, that's kind of where we fit in. Uh, so hopefully I've answered that question. Um, Yes. You can obviously check us out on www.aptome.com to learn more or write in and ask us questions. Uh, so, so back, uh, back to thank you for the question, by the way. So, thank uh, back to um, uh, back to the conversation. Uh, I think this this question inside this notion of of of, of tickets and 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 fatigue and so forth. I, I guess one of the big questions that I always asks ask CISOs, and I'll ask you, Frank, is, you know, can these things that we rely on today in a DevSecOps workflow, the traditional DevSecOps workflow, can they really, I don't know, can they really drive organizational change? Or, or are people like desensitized to them? <laughs> Do they, like, like I asked you this privately and I, I loved your answer. So I told you I was gonna ask you again. So I'm gonna ask you again, like, like can they really, drive organizational change like i'm your pen tester you you contract with me to, to to do an evaluation of your xyz i come to you i give you a report like like can that really drive organizational change uh you know uh not you but but you know out in the world do you think that that's possible or do you think something else has to happen I think it's definitely possible. I think the way I think about this is obviously, you know, there's smart exec teams and not smart exec teams. It's kind of a matter of priorities for an organization. But the way I see it is like, hey, when, you know, let's just say, let's give this example where like, hey, there's this company that's um, has DevSecOps and their DevSecOps is like just giving a lot of tickets because it's the evolution of kind of compliance to um, value delivery. And so what they know is, giving reports and tickets, it's really like the evolution of, you know, these like long vulnerability reports that used to come out of these like tools, like AppSec tools or network security tools or what have you, right? And um, then the pen test comes and the pen test discovers a lot of these pretty serious vulnerabilities. And I think if I were an executive sitting in that space, I would say, hey, look, like this is very strange. Like we're doing all this work, um, but there's clearly some gap that's occurring. Right. Um, there's some organizational gap and um, that's leading to all these problems in engineering. And how do we solve this problem? Right. What is the solution? I think that's where the change comes in is when, unfortunately, when a lot of these gaps are exposed, uh, sometimes through a pen test, sometimes, unfortunately, through an incident. Um, but I think the question there is not to solve the problem that's like described specifically in in the pen test, like whether it be an auth problem or an access problem, but to like think of it as like an organizational problem saying, hey, we have a security team. Why did they not catch it? Or is there something wrong with the way I've, you know, architected or constructed this organization so that, you know, we're we're doing a lot of things, but we're just not catching problems. Um, so how do we kind of go? And I think I've written about this a little bit. Um, it's not about solving the immediate problems, like thinking about the second or third order problem. Yeah, is it's I, like I I, I agree with that one thousand percent. I mean, one of the one of the things that we do here at here at Aptome is customers will all often or prospects and customers will always ask us, often ask us, "Hey, I don't really know what's protecting my app today. Can you do an assessment? Can you do a pen test or whatnot?" And so we do. And and you know, in 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 this example, let's assume we find something, uh, which we always find something, or we always find lots of things. Let's just say. Um, and uh, uh, when I when we present it to to the customer, the prospect, I, I'm always very quick to point out that you know this is the best that your current systems and processes can produce. Like like if you look at this kind of assessment, you know this is the state of the art of the output that 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 the way you're doing it today will will achieve. 
So don't look at it as a singular event that you then have to go solve, i.e. create tickets and give them to engineering and so forth. Look at it as a system level and process level, you know, challenge to really go back a step and look at kind of how are you delivering these? You know, I was I was having a really great conversation with uh, one of our investors put us in touch with a board member of a very large bank, and I was having a, a wonderful conversation with that board member. And the board member said, yes, you know, given given the choice between, you know, delivering differentiation uh, or delivering defense, the dev team is always going to choose differentiation because you know, that's how we get, you know, customers in the door and maintain our competitive advantage and, and improve our brand, et cetera. Um, and, and I said, absolutely. I said, defense, don't take this. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel bad that defense is second chair to that because obviously without a great app, you know, the security doesn't, doesn't really matter. So, so, and I like to say at AppDome, you know, we don't build great apps, but we sure as heck secure them. So we know we're in second chair. Um, but at the same time, you have process. If you look, if you just look at the DevOps side of the world, right, the CICD side of the world, if you just look at the engineering side of the world, I mean, there's there's tools and systems and automation galore to speed up the process and deliver, et cetera, and 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 churn out mobile applications at a at a very you know staggering rate, you know, 96 times a year, you know, in some cases. And so you you come back over to security and you say, okay, do we have that ability? To, do we have the ability to keep up without you know overburdening the dev team with a bunch of tickets? So I I do think that. There is this there this this notion of 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 kind of figuring out ways of 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 improving the foundational elements that deliver the output as opposed to just tackling the one thing that's there is is a very 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 uh, key insight that you've made and I I really I really I really appreciate appreciate that. Um, I've also heard you, and 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 perhaps it's kind of as as a function of the role that you're in. But I've also heard you even before uh, you took on this this role uh, talk a lot about an engineering approach to DevSecOps. I've heard you I've heard you say that a lot, and I always like that. I always like that. That always kind of made me think differently when you said, "Hey, I I take a very engineering approach to this." I wonder if you just describe like what does that mean? Like what what do you mean when you say that? I I have an idea of what you mean, but what do you mean when you say that? Yeah, I think a lot of it is around um, thinking. I think very broadly thinking about technical solutions, and but I think another way of thinking about it is I think I mentioned before a lot of times when we think about solving problems in an engineering or we we go to you know some mixture of three threes people process and tools and so at the end of the day um, I think in a more engineering focused solution we try to keep the people element to a minimum in some way we try to say how do we take people out of it or minimize the use of people so how do we build better tools and processes to kind of scale right and scale a lot of the repetitive work we do so a lot of it is for example around hey uh, I think a lot of this gets taken the wrong way and like people start thinking about automated reports or automated alerts, but I think a lot of it is about, hey, like, we need to take some risk, we need to think about, um, you know, priorities um, in terms of uh, building things for the product in, in the same way, like, you know, engineering orgs have to think about priorities, right, and I think the key is, like, how do we think more like an engineering org, because uh, engineering orgs do think about risk. Um, but they also think a lot about like, how do we do work? Uh, how do we deliver a product in a timely manner? Like, how do we work with other engineering orgs to become more efficient um, yeah. rather than how do we better check like some checkbox, right? Like there are very few engineering orgs, if any, that think like that. And so like, I think having that mentality of like, how do we become more efficient operationally and deliver better and better products and outcomes using technical solutions, I think is an important mentality that I think a lot of people are trying to adopt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, as I said in the introduction, you know, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a classically trained engineer, but I taught myself to code. And, and when I was learning to code, you know, there's this, there's this realization that hits you that everything that shows up 
on the proverbial page, somebody had to write something for that to show up. Like it just, you just, it sort of hits you. Like nothing just shows up. Like you have to build something. And so I always like that notion that of an engineering approach, because it, it said to me kind of a build first, like build, build the build the technology to deliver the outcome. Don't hire a bunch of people to deliver the outcome, build the technology to deliver the outcome. And I think that's really what kind of guided me in the early days of Aptome, you know, looking at security and saying, hey, you know, there is a build first answer here. But you also, I think you you also touch on something that's really, really interesting. Uh, when you, again, you think of the modern, you know, DevOps environment and the systems and tools available to engineers, you know, whether it be Git or, or, or Bitrise or Jenkins or Travis or whatever, you know, these are, these are systems of record, you know, these are systems of, like you said, moving things between team members, making them more efficient, you know, accepting them, rejecting them, pushing them, you know, uh, all of those, you know, whether it's, a, you know, you know, all of that is about, is about, is about delivery. It's about getting this, this conception of something that then is embodied in work out into a live environment that then, you know, can be utilized by the fewest number of people possible. I, I think it's just, that to me is is probably the next thing that's that's probably guided you know and where we you and I in our you know years ago when we met and and started talking about this this question where for me it was like really eye opening to kind of think think like a dev team think like think about the tools and the systems that dev teams are using because there's a tremendous amount of innovation over there there's a tremendous amount of innovation there's a tremendous amount people have spent hundreds of millions of dollars figuring out how to make you know engineering organizations efficient and and they're not done i mean they've got lots of things that they're continuing to add and evolve and so forth and as a cyber team as you're moving from from compliance to to, to value creation right let's let's say, let's actually say that let's say moving from compliance past uh operational to value creation, right on the other side of operational operational readiness, right. So now you're now you're over in the value creation uh, world, and and you don't have a cyber engineering organization like like you're blessed with there at your company, like like this this notion of of using the 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 concepts and the methodologies and the and the the frameworks and so forth that that the dev team has used to, to, to get you here inside your, your security organization is a very smart thing to do. It's a very, 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 very smart thing to do. And that's really, I mean, for me, kind of guided a lot of, you know, just within AppDome, like, you know, little things like, you know, the ability to create templates and the freeze them and, and lock them and share them and reuse them and subscribe apps to them and so forth, like automated signing, yada, 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 like all these like, like things that, that remove friction out of the process and get get that app, you know, out the door in in as fast a, as way as possible with all the recordation and event logging and user logging and whatever, you know, to make sure that there's visibility and traceability and all of that, you know, that was so powerful to me and I really I, I'm glad we had a chance to to kind of talk about that because I think and it, it's not it's not a, I don't know it shouldn't be that big of a surprise because you're classically trained as an engineer. So you're obviously going to think, you know, and Karen as well as an engineer. So she, she thinks build first, you know, and I think that that's a, such a, such an amazing uh, uh, perspective. I, I wonder uh, if we could switch gears and, and I think the same evolution is happening. Um, like we talked about a little bit um, and I said, I would come back to it um, in the SOC world i think i think as as you talked about it earlier you have this you have this 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 security operations center that's getting inputs from wherever it's getting inputs and you have a set of analysts you know who are responding to you know whatever those incidents are and so forth um and and do you think that there's a i mean i believe that there's a role for that data to play in the this other evolution uh, but but are you seeing that elsewhere? Are you seeing that data being used for other than 
incident response? Are you seeing that data being used for process and, and business evolution and process improvement and you know that sort of thing? Do you think we've made that jump yet? Or do you think, hey, the technology is not really there to do that right now? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I definitely think it's happening. I think an area where it's very obviously used is incident response. And I think a lot of it is, you know, trying to automate and not have, you know, a group of people in a room 24 seven looking at screens because that's not standardized, you know, kind of the general problems with, with kind of issues like that, where we're trying to engineer our way. And I think a lot of it is actually driven by what our company is trying to do and the evolution in, in the data world. And that before it was actually very hard to analyze this data because we didn't have a lot of infrastructure to do it. Or the infrastructure was hard and you had to maintain it, you had to negotiate with the infrastructure or IT team. But I think with these modern data warehouses like Snowflake, Databricks, BigQuery, where it's, you know, it's basically the cloud for data. So like in the, I think a lot of evolutions will happen where now we have access to like unlimited computation and storage in a sense um, to now start performing a lot of this intelligence um, work or analysis. And I think we're seeing this just generally happen in business intelligence in general and business analysis. Uh, I think we're going to kind of see it happen more as it applies to security. But security is unfortunately a late adopter for a lot of these things, but an eventual adopter as, you know, as we've seen with DevSecOps. But I think now we actually have a lot of tools in place, I think, um, and, and the ability to do it for just a normal company, right? Before, if you want to do this type of analysis, like you got to be a pretty big company, but now kind of a normal person can spin up their own data cloud in Snowflake. Just, you know, I can go online, sign up right now and have access immediately. I don't have to worry about getting a DevOps team to do it. I don't have to worry about all these processes in the same way that, you know, 10 years ago, if I had to build a company, I had to buy servers and all this stuff. Now, now I don't, it's like, it's much easier to spin up and do this type of analysis. And I think once people start realizing that and get resources, I think you'll see this more and more. I think we're just at the at the kind of like beginning of, of all this. Yeah. I, I I thank you for that. That's a that's I, I really appreciate I do agree that 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 security or cyber is a, a bit behind. Uh, I do believe that there it, you said something very powerful in the middle there. You use the word negotiate. He's like, oh, we have to negotiate. We used to have to negotiate. And, and now we have kind of access to all of this. Cyber still has to negotiate, <laughs> right? If I have a, if I have a, whatever, a pen test or a code scan or whatever, I still have to negotiate. I still have to go to the dev team and say, hey, you know, do you think, you know, maybe in your list of priorities, you could, da, 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 da. Um, you know, we still, cyber still has to negotiate. And so that to me is, is a very large area of friction that can be eliminated where you can take the data from not from a pen test or code scan, but from a live production environment and say, hey, you know, you have access now to, 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 to threat and attack data from all of your mobile applications in your, in your, in your production environment, How, whatever number that is, 100,000, 100 million or a billion, whatever, you can gather this data and you can stare at it and you can say, okay, here are the top five attacks that I have going on. I'm going to add the corresponding protections to my build. And, 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 and I'm going to deploy that in my next release right inside my CIC pipeline. And that's great from, from the standpoint of eliminating that negotiation. But another thing also happens, and this, this was very, very interesting to me. And I, I, I really, I think this is true for non-cyber organizations as well, is that having access to the data, having access to this, to this data store transforms the negotiation into a collaboration. Right. So now you're not at opposite ends, you know, battling away, but you have a common set of data that you're looking at. And, and now you have the ability to collaborate. And that is probably one of the biggest things that I've heard from our customers who are using, for example, our ThreatScope product is that all of a sudden the tension between cyber and dev kind of goes away from the standpoint of, do I really need to have this? Are you giving me overkill, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You can actually look at, you can, both sides can stare at the data and say, well, look, here's the top five attacks, you know, so this is why we're doing it. Oh, okay. It makes sense. And, and those barriers come down, you know, bring together organizations and so forth. So I think this, this notion of, like you said, this ubiquity of, of, of data access systems, et cetera, is, is really going to, I think, 
you know, increase, you know, uh, uh, velocity, agility, et cetera, within an organization. And I, I do think that, that, that cyber teams have to move very quickly in this to keep up because I, I do think, like you said, in the non-cyber world, there's like a whole, there's a whole evolution, revolution going on, um, going on, uh, going on in that. Um, so, okay. Well, uh, Karen, looks like you were going to say something. I don't want to cut you. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to bring in a question from the audience. Cause it looks like this fits in really well, um, with the discussion around where the trend is going, um, to using perhaps, uh, public cloud providers leaning on, uh, managed services and in, in essence, you know, our organizations now outsourcing more of the security capabilities to different providers and, um, and the reasons for that, right? Uh, it sounds like based on Frank, what you're saying, that is um, maybe a bit slower, but moving in that direction, would, would you agree with that? And um, and then Tom, based on your experience, you know, what have the, the companies that um, you've been speaking to most recently been yep. saying about that? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely happening. And I think, but it's kind of a little bit different than what we normally experience. I think there's been buying of tools where it's like had a plug and forget kind of situations. But now with kind of DevSecOps in the public cloud, we're thinking a lot more about, hey, we just think about some of these products as tools. It's going to help us achieve the goal, but we still have to do some implementation. We still have to do a lot of work, policy setting, process building to make this tool actually achieve our goals. And I think a lot of that is driven around the fact that uh, we're, we're kind of engineering solution we're thinking about. We could build this ourselves, but our time is best used somewhere else. Like let's buy something to assist us in doing some of these and build our own processes around it. Uh, and so I think it is happening more, but it's changing in the way of how we perceive these tools. We don't perceive them as like, I fully trust this tool. We just think of it as like, hey, it's just a tool we use. Um, we have to do a lot of work around it to get it to do what we want, but uh, we don't want to hire an engineer who's expensive to to build it and maintain it for the next X number of years. And then maybe at some point, you know, unfortunately, there's there's this thought that's always in our mind that you know five years down the line when we have more engineering. Uh oh, we seem to have lost Frank. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I will I will I will answer while we're waiting for him yes. to waiting for him to come back. Um, uh, so I think on the on the mobile DevOps side or the mobile DevSecOps side, um, you know, organizations in the in the standard CI CD pipeline have implemented cloud systems, scanning systems uh, from a variety of vendors uh, into the into the process. Um, the the challenge with that has always been uh, what I call the exception. So so in other words, you know, I get a code scan from vendor X in my CI CD pipeline. So I've got I've got two th it actually generates two things, um, two things in my organization. On the one hand, it generates tickets for the engineering team to go and to go and tackle. And on the other hand, it 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 triggers a workflow uh, for the cyber team and cyber analysts to go look for exceptions uh, and to, to provide waivers uh, to the engineering organization or to the broader organization to say, hey, you don't really have to build that because the risk is medium or low or whatever, right? And so, so there's a lot of work that happens, right? There's in fact more work that happens through the automation of a, of a code scan or, or a pen test uh, than we, re we actually really realize, right? Um, and so a lot of organizations are looking at that and saying, you know, hey, you know, we, we, we need to simplify this. We need to make this more efficient. We need to, we need to, we need to put, as, as Frank says, more emphasis on delivery and building uh, than, than, than vulnerability assessments or, 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 or ticket creation and, and, and waivers. And and it's a it's a huge shift. It's not just a mental shift, but it's an organizational shift uh, to uh, again towards delivery as opposed uh, towards towards analysis. And I think this is um, so. Yes, I, I do think people are using those, and I, I think it's a good thing overall. 
but organizations are still need to address the work that comes after and 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 streamline that uh, and and in particular target that towards the attacks that are really happening out in the wild because again keep in mind the code the even a, even the best code scan or pen tester on the planet we typically as just pure pen testers don't have access to that real world production level data that uh, that that we need uh, in order to 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 make sure that our recommendations match up with the reality of of the attack. So the ability to leverage a system to grab that data and match the defense to the reality of the attack is so vital uh, to how you deliver the best protection uh, in your mobile application. And and obviously Aptome has an answer to that. And and again, you guys can go and and look check that out and on uh, on the website and stuff. But I see Frank. Uh, has come back, uh, hopefully, um, on mute. Um, so, Yeah, and, and we can go into the final thoughts here. Um, if, Frank, you want to start with that, or, or Tom, um, just in closing, what are your final thoughts and recommendations to our audience? I'm not sure Frank is. Frank's on mute right now. Oh, there he is. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm back. My this is the perils of work from home, which is a, probably a different security topic to cover. <laughs> but uh, uh, but sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, Tom, why don't you why don't you go ahead and and I, I can kind of follow up with some of my thoughts afterwards. Yeah, sure. So so uh, so not not surprisingly, I mean, my my final thoughts are, you know, along the lines of these conversations. You know, if you take an engineering approach, and for that matter, an engineering ops approach. Uh, to delivering uh, uh, defenses inside a mobile application, you're you're gonna you, you you're gonna be in a better place, uh, particularly if that approach is data driven uh, to to stop the attacks that matter most to your business and your users and your mobile application. The key is to target those those live attacks and to use systems and processes that are going to allow you to be able to get there uh, consistently. So you got to shift your mind into delivery. You have to shift your mind past the operational uh, evolution to the value creation uh, component of, of cyber uh, to deliver the best defenses that matter most to the business. And, and technology and systems are the primary mechanism that you use to get there. Uh, so that's my, that's my closing thought. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think we're seeing a shift in this industry and I don't know how long it'll take um, but we're definitely seeing a movement um, into more engineering focused approaches just because of the nature of attacks, um, the sophistication of attacks, the number of um, technologies that's being used in general and the pervasiveness of cloud technologies and technologies in general. So I think, you know, in some way there's an inevitable shift that in that direction. And so I think some companies will get ahead of it first, but it, it's going to be kind of a journey. Um, but I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to just improve the industry in general. Cool. Great. Uh, well, thank you both for your comments and your perspectives. Uh, it was a great discussion. And thank you to the audience for your questions. We, we appreciate that. Um, if you want to share this with anyone on your team or others, we will be sending out this recording and look forward to speaking to the future. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.